Now, AM650 presents It's Your Money, an up-close and personal look at your finances. Here's your host, Fred Snyder. Up in the morning and out to school. Okay, we're back. The teacher is teaching the golden rule. We're back. We're live. American history we're interactive. Man. We're here to talk about your money. More importantly, about your money and how to keep it. We expect you to call the show. Get on the line and give us a call. This show, once again, I remind you, is live. It's interactive. You just listen to an hour of last week's show. This one is live, and we want you, our listening audience, to participate in the show. And you may do so by making a simple phone call. Area code 604-280-0650. If you're calling long distance, it's one 877 650 if you're shy or reluctant to talk on the air, you can talk to Frida. Frida's down at the office at area code 604-737-3512. If you're calling long distance, it's 1-800-661-1495. You might call Frida if you want to make an appointment for a second opinion on your investment portfolio. You might call Frida if you want a free, no-obligation, written financial plan. These are some of the reasons to make contact with her. Maybe... You can't get through the radio station for one reason or another, but you still want to make a call. You still want to have a question that you want to ask. You might call Frida in that event, too. So I'm going to give the number there out once again. It's area code 604-737-3512, long distance, 1-800-661-1495. We talk on this show about your money. More importantly, how to keep it. How to keep it is the most important part of that expression because we don't do a very good job in that area because they didn't educate us when we went to school. They didn't teach us what we needed to know to make wise financial decisions. Um, anyway, I just, uh, I'm here to talk about your money. I had this problem last week and here, here we come here, here again. Bill Gates is knocking on the door again. I don't understand what's going on here, but, uh, I don't, I'm going to tell him to remind me later. I hope he doesn't pop in here again. I'll try that. Don't remind me. No, remind me later. I better leave it at that. Okay. Hard to, I, hard to walk and chew gum at the same time. So I, I don't want the same thing to happen that happened last time, last week. So Frida down at the office, area code 604-737-3512, long distance, 1-800-661-1495. Again, we're talking about your money, more importantly about your money, how to keep it. We're going to do a case study, as we did last week, a new, brand new case study. It's around a half a million dollar investment, uh, and it's a real live situation. The client actually did business with me. So, um, uh, again, if you have any questions or comments, we welcome them. And we're here to talk about the financial planning process. So I'm going to just branch off here. To the case study so let's do that right now and this is the case study so i remind you once again ladies and gentlemen and listeners out there that this was done march the 8th 2014. the following is a snapshot in time measuring an existing portfolio as if it had been passively invested which means buy and hold over the period of time illustrated which is roughly 10 years the returns illustrated in the course in, and the corresponding risk associated with the position is based on past performance in no way guarantees future performance will be the same. It is merely the track record of the investments illustrated. Mutual funds, I remind you once again, are not guaranteed. Values fluctuate. Past performance may not be repeated. The information presented is believed to be accurate and comes from GlobeAdvisor.com. So it's the, the information is public matter. Okay, these are public facts. So again, if we look at the comparison uh, portfolio, that's the one I'm going to do. I'm going to skip some of this because it would take too long. I, I need a, a radio show that was two or three hours long to be able to cover all that territory. But what I want to do, maybe I'll just start with the current portfolio, which is the case study. So here we're going to look at what this per particular person has right now. In the light of strategic asset allocation, which means what's the asset mix? How much money is invested in bonds? How much in cash? How much in, in equities or stocks or mutual funds? We're going to look at that in table form and a chart form. We're going to look at the geographical asset allocation. That's how much money is invested in Canada, 
how much money is invested in the United States and how much money is in Europe and so on around the world, the global asset allocation. We're going to look at equity sectors, how much money is invested in financial institutions, manufacturing, energy, and so on. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at how it's diversified by style. We're talking about whether it's growth, whether it's value, whether it's uh, multi-managed. We're going to look at the annual returns, the compound returns, the growth of $10,000 invested. We're going to look at it in terms of risk. How risky is that particular portfolio? And what's the best and worst 12 months? Now, those are all great yardsticks to measure a portfolio. Now, I guarantee that 99% of the people listening to this show haven't got the foggiest idea how their portfolio stacks up in those particular areas. And you need to know, because that's how you evaluate what you have right now. So this is an actual case study. So let's take a look at it. Let's look at the strategic asset allocation first. So here's your strategic asset allocation. 25% of the money is in international equities. That includes the United States. Other is 0.27. It's not enough to even make a comment on. Canadian equities is only 15.63. Cash is 8.58 and bonds is 50.55. Now, I would say that more money should be invested in Canadian equities and maybe at the expense of the international equities. In other words, it should be at least 50-50 to recognize what's going on right now. Cash is okay, 8.58%. Anything up, anything less than 10% is okay. Bonds is okay. That mitigates risk. That depends on your age. But this particular client, I, I know who he or and she is, they're at or near retirement. So that would be a good mix. So if we take a look at that graphically, international equities, that's the piece of the pie. Other is here. Canadian equities is 15.63, as I said earlier. Cash is 8.58. Bonds is half the portfolio. That's the strategic asset allocation mix. So tell me this. You're listening to the show right now. Do you know what your strategic asset allocation is? What is it and what should it be? That's a question you need to ask your advisor because you should know. Some organizations have what they call the age balance indicator. So that if you're 50 years of age, you should have 50% of your money in fixed income. That's bonds. And that would be the case here. Okay. Um, I, I don't have a strong argument against this asset mix totally. Except I'd like to see more U.S. and uh, an equal amount between uh, international and Canadian equity. That's just fine-tuning. Minor issue. We, if we look at that in a table, these are the funds that are held and make up that particular portfolio. We got RBC Select Balance Fund, 7.32%. RBC Select Choices Balance, 7.26. RBC Select Choices Conservative, 1.15. RBC Select Conservative, 84.27%. Now that is putting all your eggs almost in one basket. That's 84% of the whole portfolio in one fund. The risk on, based on standard deviation is three. That's three-year risk, standard deviation of three. That's pretty low. That's, that's okay. The uh, five-year rate, rate of return on that particular portfolio is 4.55. The better returning, every other one of these funds that is held has, has uh, produced a better rate of return. Risk is a little more aggressive. But really, that's too much money in one fund. That should be better diversified. And secondly, it's all with RBC. One, one company, one fund represents just about the whole portfolio. Five-year rate of return is 4.6% on the weighted average of the holdings in that particular portfolio. The 10-year rate of return is 4.65. It's okay. It's not bad. It's better than a GIC. And it's not as taxable as a GIC. So it's, it's okay. But I would rate that neutral. Three, three ratings, positive, negative, or neutral. I would rate that as neutral. We can look at it chart-wise. Again, I like pictures worth a thousand words. There's the big piece of the pie that's in RBC Select Conservative Fund. Rate of return 4.55 over the last uh, five years. The geographical asset allocation. Again, when we look at the equity side of the portfolio, we have 38.52% of the money in Canada. 
and we have 30.13% uh, in the U.S. And the rest are all so small, it's almost insignificant. So the, the ratio between Canada and the United States on the equity side of the portfolio, that's the stock side, is 38.52 compared to 30.13. That's better. That gets a little more in the United States on the equity side. So I wouldn't argue with that too much. Positive, negative, or neutral? Ah, closer to positive. Somewhere between neutral and positive. The equity sector style which represents how much money is invested in financial institutions, consumer discretionary, energy, and so on. And, and, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, listeners out there, if you have a computer, you can log on. This is, this, this is a webcast. It's, it's live on the Internet. And if you're out there, if you log on to www.am650radio.com and click on Watch TV, you'll be able to watch this show live. I'm at a disadvantage when I'm using pictures and graphs, if you can't see them, so I try to paint a word picture as, 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 as well as I can, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So we look at financial institutions. We have a, an awful lot of money in financial institutions, 25.8%. It's the largest single holding in the whole portfolio. Consumer discretionary. Energy, like energy is 14.2%. I think energy should be the number one holding and financial should be number two. If we look at the other holdings, there they are, and you can see the ratios between each of these. Portfolios need to be diversified by sector. Again, you can't have all your eggs in one basket. If you have too much money in financial institutions and interest rates go up, you're going to get hurt. The portfolio is not going to perform well in a rising interest rate environment because financial institutions are in the um, you know, they sell investments, they take in deposits, and they lend the money out, and they, 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 they pay. When interest rates go higher, they pay more for their inventory. That's the money that they lend out, and they lend it out at maybe the same kind of interest rate. So there's a squeeze on profits when it comes to financial institutions when interest rates rise. And those will say, yeah, but they're doing pretty well right now, and, and indeed they are. But that's because interest rates have been fairly benign. If you asked me 10 years ago what are interest rates going to do, I would have said they're going to go up, and they didn't. I would have been wrong. Um, and nobody can really call that. And one of these days, we're going to have a jump in interest rates that's going to be a bit of a disaster. So you don't want to be too heavily committed to long-term bonds and financial institutions. The style analysis. When we look at style, we have 65% of the money in large-cap Mid-cap, 10. This 24%, I couldn't get a reading on it with the software. And small cap is 1. But needless to say, there should be more money in, uh, less money in large cap and more money in mid-cap and small cap. Not just 1% as an example. Again, I would rate that as neutral. The fund equity style. In this case, it wasn't defined in the software just said non-applicable. So when the software did the analysis, it couldn't find the style of those particular funds. For I don't know what reason. When I look at bonds, we have too much money in government bonds, 52%. Not enough money in corporate, which is shorter term. It should be uh, maybe 30%, uh, 25% uh, government, and the rest in corporate. Uh, that's because they're shorter term. If interest rates go up, you don't get hurt as much on the shorter term bonds as you do the long term bonds. Market maturity, developed countries 97, very little in emerging markets. I don't have an argument with that. This just explains the bond holdings and so on. I don't, I've already pretty well done that. But this, again, I remind you, is an assessment of an existing live portfolio using the software that's available on the Internet and producing for you an MRI of your investment portfolio, a way for you to analyze and determine whether your portfolio is suitable and doing the job that it's supposed to do. Whether it's too risky or not risky enough, you have to assess that. So again, number to call, area code 604-280-0650. Long distance, 877-280-0650. 
You can log on www.am650radio.com or call Freedoms down at the office. Area code 604-737-3512. Long distance 800-661-1495. Get in the line give us a call. This is an important call because we're talking about, if it isn't, it should be the most important topic in your life, your money. Who doesn't care about their money? And if you spend it all, it isn't your money anymore. It's somebody else's. So really, it's, it's not about how much you make that counts. It's about how much you keep. And your ability to keep money depends on having a good solid budget so that you have money left over and not a deficit at the end of the month. And a good place to put that money. A place to invest whatever's left over. Not letting it just build up in a bank account. That's what we're talking about. Annual rates of return. We can look at the annual rates of return on that portfolio. And this is the annual rates of return going back to 2006. 2006, it was 9.16%. Pretty good. 2007, 1.97. Well, not so good. Neutral, maybe. Uh, 2008, in the, in the recession, it went down 13.1. It's not bad because just about everything, everything else went down more. 2009 was a great year, 11.74. 2010, 5.9. 2011, uh, an 11.29%. 2012, 6.22. Uh, not bad. Better than a GIC, but not the best. Again, picture's worth a thousand words. There's a, uh, there's a chart which illustrates those annualized returns. That's not the compounded rates. Those are the annual rates of return. So let's look at the compound. If we, if we convert those annual rates of return to compound rates of return, these are the compound rates. Over five years, is 5.97%. Now, how many people listening to this show right now enjoyed a compound rate of return of 5.97% on their money over the last five years? I dare say there's quite a few, okay? Uh, it's not a bad rate of return. It's still better than the GIC. Three years is 1.19. So if you bought this portfolio three years ago and looked at it today, your compound rate is 1.19. You could have done just as well in a GIC. Okay. If you bought it a year ago, you're up 8.65. Not bad. Year to date is 1.71. That's half the year. Last three months is 2.54. Last month is 0.16%. Those are the compound rates. And again, you can see them there. So your best was last year on a compounded basis of 6.81. That's what you experience, not the year-over-year the -year rates return. That's what you actually experience. So if I take that now and I look at the growth of a $10,000 investment, and this is the one I like the best because it's almost the bottom line. This is, if you invested $10,000 approximately 10 years ago, this is what would have happened. For about the first four or five years, you would have been pretty happy. Your portfolio went from $10,000 to $13,700. You're telling everybody your advisor is the Wizard of Wall Street. Give them a call. Lots of referrals, okay? But then we had the recession. And there's the recession. And that covers almost five years as well. And that's five years of no return. That's five years of falling off the cliff and just getting back back out. You went in the hole and you just climbed out after five years. And you just got out and it come up nicely and it went right back down again. So I had, had a little more time to that. None, no performance over five or six years right there. So you, your experience in this portfolio would depend on when you bought. If you bought it at, at the beginning and you sold it at the top before it went down, you, you were up $3,700. But if you hung in there, you lost it all, and it went down to about 11000 From and memory only put in ten. Then it recovered, and it's backed up to thirteen seven. And then we had another nice leg of growth. You ended up with $15,761. Now, that means that if you put in 10000 you ended up with up five, almost $6,000 more than you invested over a 10-year period. It's not bad. It's not the best. I'm going to say it again. It's not bad, but it's not the best. 
And you got to understand that. And you got to also understand that your experience depended on when you got on the, on the plane. If you got on the plane 10 years ago and you were tough enough to, to ride it out through the thick and thin and the ups and the downs and everything else, you're not in bad shape. But you had a lot of worrying to do over that entire period of time. If you bought here at the bottom uh, in 2008, you'd be laughing all the way to the bank. Okay? When did you get on the plane? I'm not, you know, everybody listening to this show who have a similar portfolio won't have the same experience because there was buying and selling and trading and everything else going on over that period of time. I am simply demonstrating the track record of this particular portfolio. Track record is not terrific. This demonstrates the characteristics of that particular portfolio. You got to understand that. So what do you think? What are your questions? What are your comments on what we're talking? Is this valuable to you or not? Because I can change, I can talk about financial planning and so on. I think that everybody is interested in case studies. If you're not, you should be. The number to call, area code 604-280-0650. Long distance is 877-280-0650. Log on, www.am650radio.com. And you can watch it live on your computer. doesn't matter where you are in the whole wide world as long as you have an Internet connection. And uh, you can call Frida down at the office if you're shy or reluctant to talk on the air. Want more information, 604-737-3512, long distance, 800-661-1495. So again, let's look at risk. How risky is this particular portfolio? Well, risk in our industry is measured by what we call standard deviation. Moderate risk is 10, measured by standard deviation. This portfolio is 3.28. So if we look at that on a chart, there's the standard three-year de uh, standard deviation is 2.28. And how does that compare? Well, on a, if 10 is moderate, there, that bar represents 10. And it's 3.28, so it's closer to low than it is to high. So it's pretty low. That's, that's an outstanding position to be from a risk point of view. It's not very risky. It doesn't return super returns, but it's not risky either. And no risk is like a GIC, and, you get, and it's fully taxable, and that's the only alternative to what we're talking about. So the market risk in this case is 3.28, low to moderate, closer to low than moderate, when measured by standard deviation based on three years. So get on the line, give us a call. Let's talk about your money and how to keep it. That's what we're, that's what the issue is. How to keep it is really what it's all about. And we're teaching you how to keep your money. This is about your financial IQ. And let's raise your financial IQ by participating in the show. Let's give us a call. We have some calls coming in right now. Let's talk to Bernard from Richmond. Bernard, welcome to the program. Hey, Fred. How are you? Pretty good, Bernard. How are you? It's a fantastic day. It is gorgeous. Uh, there, just, uh, just got out of church and thought I'd give you a call. That's nice. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm just uh, really happy to hear your radio program every week that I can, and I think it's amazing. So uh, so things are going okay with you? Oh, they're going fine. I have yeah. no, no, nothing and, to complain uh, about. Why in the world yeah. would I ever complain anyway? It doesn't do any good. It doesn't change anything. People yep. call you a negative thinker, and they run in the opposite direction. If you're mm -hmm. Dale Carnegie in his famous book, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, says, never criticize, condemn, or complain. Yeah, it's, it's always You good. want to be popular, don't criticize, don't condemn, don't complain. Yeah. So I have no complaint. Every, every, everything, and I'm, I mean it when I say that, everything is going terrific. Yeah, well, I, I always like to plan the endless vacation as the way I look at it. That's the way it is in life. Like you were talking about getting on the plane, you know, all mm -hmm. of the energy that it takes to even planning to deal with a travel agent and getting a plane ticket, which everyone does for two weeks every year. Sure. But, you know, you might have that endless vacation. It could be 20, 30 years or 40 years. You know, you just don't know. Right. And mm -hmm. that's the risk that we got to take in life is that, you know, get on that plane and what you need to pack along your journey. Don't you agree, Fred? Yeah, but you're absolutely right. I was updating my financial planning software. I've written my own financial planning software to do financial plans, and mm -hmm. I've, I've had it for a long time, and I'm just bringing it right up to date, working on it this morning, in fact, before I came out here. 
And one of the issues in there is for snowbirds, and I'm talking about uh, out-of-country travel insurance. When you're out of the country, you end up in hospital. Are you covered? Yeah. You ever give that some thought? You well, know, that's, that's, uh, I know. Where, that's where can you buy travel insurance where, where, where you're covered for pre-existing conditions? Well, that's the, the thing. You've got to make sure that you have the right insurance. I have a brother who has a heart issue, and uh, he spends half the year in Florida. I better give him a call and ask him if he's covered by, by uh, travel insurance. Yeah, I, I have travel insurance myself, uh, which I get for $50 a year that covers up to me for $10,000 for me and my family, which is an amazing deal. But, I think Manulife you know, Life has a, has a policy that's permanent. You just pay for so much a year and you're covered. Yeah, well, that's the beautiful thing is you just look at it as every year. If you plan to skip across the border to save a few bucks on gas and groceries or something, which yeah, people you get in the car time accident, time, you're in the right? hospital, you got a problem. Yeah, I know they could be in total <clears> risk. <throat> and uh, the other thing is, like when you even get car for car insurance, you know, mm-hmm. that's another thing that you look at saving. And what I love about you, Fred, is that you're open to all the uh, the people and everything. You have, you know, a lot of things to offer for everyone. And, you know, people should be calling you in and going to your seminars. Uh, you're a guy that could actually train financial planners, you know. I I've mean, done, you, you know, guy. something I, that, that I've done. I know. <laughs> For many I've years. learned so much from you, Fred, and I really, really honor and appreciate that everything you've done. And uh, I look at the quality time that we spent together on that fishing trip, which will be going on. And I hope that one day that me and you can get together and do another trip, like a, a, a cruise, and maybe train a few people about what there is to do with their lives and how to have a better time and save money. Well, organize one, uh, Bernard. You can collect all the money, and I won't charge. I was you like, know, but but I should probably um, hmm. uh, let some other callers get in. And okay. I, you know, and if anyone hasn't called in that's afraid of calling, please uh, make that call. You know, don't be afraid because fear, as Fred said, is false evidence appearing real you know he uses great acronyms huh. he always say don't uh people most people they don't plan to fail they just fail to plan and you need a detailed written financial plan of uh action like a, a financial blueprint and fred is the architecture to your design well, if you don't have a plan uh, bernard the default plan is a plan to fail yeah so 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 you really do have a plan it may not be formal but you're planning to fail when you don't have well, a plan I have a written financial plan from you, and, and uh, I'm happy with it. And, you know, the thing is, is when you get it written down, then you realize that you have to uh, revise it. Absolutely. So that's the way it is in life, you know, revision and stuff like that. So, so I'm, I'm always looking at ways and saving a dollar and uh, working smarter, not harder. And every day in every way, it keeps getting better and better. But just surrounding yourself by successful people is a good way of doing it. You're very successful, Fred. You've well, thank you very much, Bernard. I really appreciate your, your, yeah. your, your call. You, well, I'm just telling you the honest truth. Yeah. I'm not saying anything else. That Fred is, is the man, the guy that I go through. And back in 2008, when the markets went down, you know, Fred was there to help us out. All us and we got through that one okay. Yeah. That we was a tough through, time. And, and there's probably going to be another one. That's the way it works in life. <laughs> but every right? seven years or so. Yeah, it's a cycle. It's yeah. a cycle. So, so um, anyway, somebody was Fred, saying that on the radio the, the other, other day. Let callers yeah. get in and let's get together for some quality time and have another meeting again soon. Okay, Bernard. Okay, all and, the best to you and your family. God bless and have a fantastic day. Bye thanks. Now. Thanks for calling in. appreciate yeah. the call. Okay. Okay, God if you just well. joined us, ladies and gentlemen and listeners out there, I'm certified financial planner Fred Snyder, also a registered financial planner representing Scotia McLeod. We're soliciting your phone calls. We want you to call the show. We want to talk to you about your money. More importantly, how to keep it. Now, how much of your money have you kept? Ask yourself, how long have I worked? How much money have I made? I know you've made a small fortune. How much of that do you have left today? And are you happy with the answers? And the chances are you are not. And the chances are you did not achieve any measure of financial success because you didn't know how to. Nobody taught you about budgeting. Nobody taught you about compound interest. Nobody taught, uh, taught you about debt, how to make interest expense tax deductible. Nobody taught you about life insurance. Many people come into my office and they have a life insurance policy and they think it's a terrific investment. Life insurance, ladies and gentlemen, is a protection plan. It's not an investment plan. Okay. So 
you got all these issues and much, much more to deal with when we talk about financial planning. Ask yourself one simple question. Do I have a deficit? Do you have a deficit in your finances, which means on a monthly basis you spend more than you earn? Is that happening to you? How would you know if you, if you, do, if you don't have a budget? One way you know is if you don't have any money in the bank. Another way you know is if you've racked up your, your credit cards and your credit cards are all maxed out or your line of credit is borrowed to the hilt. When you spend more than you earn, this is what happens. Your expenses go up, probably, because you have to either sell assets, which means you, you make less return on your assets, so your income is decreased. You borrow the money, now you've got to pay interest. That's, that increases expense. So you already are negative when it comes to expenses. Now you're increasing the expenses even more. Someone once said to me, how do you get out of a hole? The answer is you stop digging. So if, if you're in the hole financially, you got to start with your budget. This is how much money I earn. This is how much I spend. And unfortunately, I have a deficit. So this is the way it should be. How can I fix it? I'm going to sit down with Snyder and I'm going to go over my income and my expenses line by line and say, is there some way to fix this? Is there some way to patch it? How can I make it better? And if you make it better and you end up with a surplus of $300 a month, what are you going to do with the $300 a month? Just let it sit in the bank? you got to invest that money in something so that it's, it's going to grow. So what you have to do is make sure that your bank grows, your piggy bank grows, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger because it gets better returns, but you also have to feed the piggy bank. you got to put some money into it. That's your surplus cash flow. So you need cash flow. So getting back to my case study, because I got off the topic there, I get a little passionate about that issue sometimes. But getting back to the case study, this is the worst and best 12 months in this particular portfolio. For the year ending February 2010, the portfolio that we're looking at or featuring returned 17.4%. That's the best year of, of returns, the year ending February 2010. The worst, uh, ten, the, the worst one-year period is the year ending February 2009. It was minus 14.9. So the best you could expect out of that portfolio is 17.4% based on past performance. The worst is minus 15%. That's not bad. Because remember, there is risk in the market. You, there's nobody can eliminate risk. There's no way that I can find a portfolio that... I can say to you there's no risk in this portfolio because that would not be the truth. Every portfolio has varying degrees of risk. And that's, what is, that's called systematic risk in terms of the investment industry. So everything has systematic risk. And you can't diversify that risk away. You can mitigate it, you can reduce it, but you can't diversify it away. Then you have unsystematic risk, which is the actual investments themselves. And in theory, at least, if you choose the right investments, you can eliminate uh, unsystematic risk. So that's what we're talking about. And again, if we look at that chart-wise, there's what it looks like. So there's your, your best and your worst case scenario on that particular portfolio. Now, you say, well, is that good or bad or not? I say, well, it's kind of like neutral. But bad or good compared to what? You've got to compare it to something. So how would you compare that to something else? And when we come back after the break, we'll do that comparison. So don't go away. Fred Snyder. I want people to call the show that are genuinely interested in increasing their financial IQ so that they can become financially independent sooner and stay financially independent longer. Fred Snyder. You don't have a blueprint. Imagine trying to build a house without a blueprint. And, and, and how about having a blueprint for your life? What are your lifestyle goals? You need to think about your family life. What are your goals about your family life? What are your lifestyle goals when it comes to health? What are your lifestyle goals when it comes to finances? mental and spiritual. You have to set goals in all those areas, not just finances. Fred Snyder. Often we fail because we put too much emphasis on one area and ignore everything else. We work our butts off and, and we ruin our health. So life is all about balance. So you need a you need a life plan. Fred Snyder. Napoleon Hill says this, wrote the book Think and Grow Rich. Anything that you can vividly imagine, ardently desire, 
and enthusiastically act upon will inevitably come to pass. Fred Snyder. My goal, my mission is to help people enhance their financial IQs by teaching, teaching them what they need to know to make better financial decisions. Fred Snyder, Sunday mornings at 9 on AM 650. This is CISL Vancouver. All-time favorites, AM 650. Welcome back to It's Your Money on AM 650. If you have a question for Fred, call 604-280-0650. Now, back to Fred. So if you want to get a second opinion on your investment portfolio, if you want an X-ray or an MRI of that particular portfolio, measuring it as to its performance, past performance, its potential performance, the various uh, levels of risk, whether it's suitable or not for you, it's time to make a phone call. So again, not getting a lot of calls today, so I assume that everybody's quite happy with their overall financial picture, and I doubt that very much. Okay, the, the number to call is area code 604-280-0650. You're calling long distance, it's 877-280-0650. You want to talk to Frida, she's down at the office at area code 604-737-3512. Long distance, 800-661-1495. You want to see what we're talking about here today? It's a, You can watch television, you can log on using your computer onto the internet, www.am650radio.com. And click on Watch TV, and you can watch this show, see what we look like, see the charts and everything that I'm talking about. What I'm going to do right now is compare three positions. I'm going to compare the existing portfolio with the benchmark and with model portfolio uh, number five, which is the, one of my model portfolios. And let's take a look at them. So strategic asset allocation. We have uh, the benchmark is, is 60% Canadian equities and 40% bonds. Cash, nothing. Portfolio 7.5, which is what I'm recommending as a replacement, is international equity 4.99, 14.99. Other is 0 0.20. Canadian equity is 21.76. Cash is 5.13. Bonds is 57.93. The existing portfolio that we already talked about, international equity is 24.97, other is 0.27, Canadian equity is 15.63, cash is 8.58, and bonds is 50.55. So I'm a little more in bonds. And there's the chart. So I'm, I'm a little heavier in bonds in this particular case because this particular person is retired. I want to I want to reduce risk, okay? So I got some callers on the line. I'm going to take those callers, and, uh, and then we'll come back to this as soon as I finish. We'll talk first of all to Kathy in Vancouver. Kathy, welcome to the program. Hi, Fred. Hi, Kathy. <clears throat> I'm just phoning to ta thank you. Um, I've been listening to you for a few years now, and realizing that I need to know more about my own finances. I've been reading about <laughs> and listening to you, going on the internet, and uh, I have to say, it's all because of you. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate that a lot. I had a I had a lady come into the office that told me that uh, her husband was uh, was was dying. He had a terminal disease, and uh, she had a lot of money. wasn't even invested with me, but she said that my husband told me when he when he's gone, that she was to come to nobody but me, because mm -hmm. he had all that money because he listened to my advice, but he didn't invest with me. Well, and, and we, my husband and I, our, our finances aren't invested with you either. Mm -hmm. um, and what I want to do, I want to read, I've got four books right now from the library, because uh, my husband and I are both very near retirement. In fact, I'm on disability <clears throat> in my 60s. My husband is still working past 65. Um, you know, we've got a portfolio. We've got defined benefit pension plans. I think we're going to be okay. But I sure wish that I started becoming um, aware of finances, uh, you know, reading about this, knowing exactly where we were going at a much younger age than waking up at 55 and, and deciding, oh, that, maybe we better learn about this. Kathy, that's, what, that's exactly what happens to most people. Yeah. 
And, you know, all this information that I put out, you may not need it. Some people do. Some people don't. Acquire it anyway. Give it to your kids. Teach your kids. Pass it on to your kids. Get your exactly. kids to listen to the show. Exactly. That's what it's all about. Yeah. You know? But, Kathy, uh, you want a second opinion on your investment portfolio? Just give Frida a call. I will. You know what? I'm getting ready. I'm going to get that knowledge so I know, know what <laughs> questions to ask and I know what you're talking about. And, uh, yeah, you can expect to hear from me down the road. Okay, Kathy. Really appreciate your call. You take care. Thank you. Enjoy the Bye. rest of the weekend. Okay. Bye for now. Let's talk to Rosie from Vancouver. Rosie, welcome to the program. Good morning, Fred. Good morning, Rosie. How are you doing? Fine. How are you? Good. I'm glad you're back uh, with the live um, programs again. Oh, I've, I've always had a live program. <laughs> I miss them all. <laughs> just just moved it around a few times. Yeah. Yeah, my, my question is like, you know, if one wants to invest right now, Mm -hmm. Where everything is so high, I hear that uh, all the markets are at all time highs. Real estate is at all time highs in Vancouver, <laughs> at least. And if someone is uh, want to invest, it's hard. Uh, where do you find something to make it grow? Well, that's why that's why you have to pick investments that have track records. Mm -hmm. I, I I I don't recommend any investment that has less than a five year track record. I want to look at the last five years. I want to look at how it did in the recession mm -hmm. and how it came back from the recession. If you look at my case studies, you can see what they have done. I'll be coming up with one here in a minute. You can see what they did in the recession. This model portfolio that I'm talking about right now in the recession went down only 8%. Mm -hmm. And then it recovered big time after that. Mm -hmm. um, the Toronto Stock Exchange in the recession went down almost 50%. So uh, you, you have to get a portfolio that is efficient, and that's not easy to do. There's, uh, there's over 20,000 investment funds out there right now to pick from. Mm -hmm. And what's the selection process? How do you decide what to invest? It's, very, it's a very rare occasion that somebody comes into my office and uh, they have the best funds in their portfolio. Very, very rarely. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't understand that because I don't understand why any investment advisor wouldn't advise their clients mm -hmm. to uh, put their money into the best funds. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, where do you see the TSX going from these highs? And like what, well, how you, much you, you more know, percentage? Rosie, you use the word high. Let's mm -hmm. talk about that for a minute. I, I entered this business in 1964. Mm -hmm. The Dow Jones was less than 1,000. And everybody then said it's too high. That's why it can't get through a thousand. Mm -hmm. It's pushing seventeen thousand now. Right. So what's high? Is it's relative. Uh, high. High means is it overvalued? Is it, is the market overpriced? That's that's the right question. Most and, of it is. Well, maybe, maybe not. That's that that's what the analysts do. The analysts determine whether it's overpriced or not. Warren Buffett has been the world's most successful investor by a wide margin. Mm -hmm. And this is Warren Buffett's style. If he doesn't understand it, he won't buy it. He didn't understand computer technology, he wouldn't get involved in it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, he won't buy it unless he can buy it cheap. He wants to buy it at a discount. He wants to buy what he considered it to be less than its intrinsic value. Okay? So he, if he can buy something at a discount, in his own mind, he believes that that's going to recover sooner or later, and he's going, to, he's going to patiently sit on it until it does. He doesn't believe in market timing. He doesn't believe that because it goes down, you should necessarily sell it. Okay? He wants to buy it after it's gone down. Right. Okay? That's the key. Uh, so you need to have a portfolio that's well-balanced, and that's why I'm talking about exactly what I'm doing here today because right. that, that, that's the issue that I'm addressing. I may, I may be complicating it too much, because I'm getting highly technical with a lot of issues, and I try not to do that. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is, there isn't any other way. I, I um, o occasionally address a, a room full of actuaries. There's about 100 of them. And one of the first questions I ask them, you guys all manage pension money. How many people in this room, how many of you know, can tell me what the markets are going to do? Put your hand up. No hands go up. Not a single one. Now, these guys are all managing huge pools of money. 
my clients expect me to be able to predict what the markets are doing, and I'm going to tell you right now, I can't, and I don't know anybody else that can with a high, with a high degree of accuracy. You can make uh, good, solid judgments and say it's probably going to go up for these reasons, but you don't know. We could have a geological uh, earthquake or something like that that could upset the apple cart. We could have a war in, in, in the Ukraine or Korea. Um, we don't know, and that's the problem. And all kinds of things cause the market to perform. Right. What makes the market go up is really sentiment. If people think the market's going to go up, it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy and it will go up. If they think it's going to go down, it'll go down, and that will also become a self-fulfilling prophecy. The, um, uh, the numbers is called fundamental analysis, and if, if, if the numbers are good, that doesn't mean the stock's going to go up. The numbers are good. Nobody wants to buy it. The stock may go down. That would be a Warren Buffett deal. Warren, Warren Buffett would, would, would look at the fundamentals and say, hey, it's, it's real cheap. I'm going to buy it. Right. What about gold? Do you think it's time to get back into gold, gold stuff, uh -huh. or something like that? Because they, they're the, pretty much the only ones that are, that are down. Well, let me, let me, it's, it's an excellent question. So let's, let's just talk about gold. This is what you do, and at the risk of getting too technical, I'm, I'm going to try to explain it in simple language. When gold goes up, U.S. stocks usually go down, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Okay? They never, or not never, but rarely go in the same direction at the same time. So the fact that gold is weak right now and has been weak, what's the opposite of that? The U.S. US market has been strong. Mm -hmm. And there's a negative correlation between gold and U.S. stocks. And that's, what, that's the term that you use for what I'm talking about. So what you want to do to mitigate risk inside your portfolio is buy investments that are negatively correlated to each other. So if you buy Canadian stocks, you find something that's negatively correlated to Canadian stocks. You buy gold, you buy something that's negatively correlated to gold. You buy real estate. You, uh, like real estate in Toronto and real estate in B.C., usually there's a negative correlation between the two of those. Uh, there's a negative correlation between uh, the U.S. and Europe, as an example. And it's not always true, so don't... don't <laughs> Don't take what I'm saying as the gospel truth because I'm saying most of the time that's the way it works. And that's why you can't call markets. It's impossible. So the key to the whole thing is to diversify, diversify, diversify. And that's what I'm talking about here today. That's what you have to do. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your show and, and your explanations are really great. Um, when are you bringing the... Um um, you know, seminars that used to do on Thursdays every day. Oh, you guys are going to get the best of me because I got everybody chasing me right now to bring, start them up again. So I guess I will. But what I want to do, I want I wanted to refresh my material, and it takes a lot of time to prepare my material. And I I I, I want to make this is one case study. I've completed five so far. When I when I get twenty of them done, I'm going to restart my seminars. That's great. Okay. Uh, to, to, to do one of these, it takes a uh, better part of a day, eight hours. Uh -huh. um, and, and all the information, again, comes from Globe Advisor, so it's all public record. So all this information is as accurate. I believe it's accurate. I can't guarantee accuracy because it's not my data, but it comes from public records. Very nice. Well, Fred, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, and I Rosie. Hope you have a wonderful day. Keep it up. You enjoy the rest of the weekend. Will okay, do. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, listeners out there, we got about 15 minutes to go, so this is your opportunity to make a phone call. You want to get in on what we're talking about. You want a second opinion on your investment portfolio, a written financial plan. Um, and, again, talking about workshops and seminars, I'm prepared to do a workshop or seminar anywhere, anytime. You have a group of people. Maybe you, maybe you own a company. You might have 30 or 40 or 50 employees. You want me to do a seminar for your employees? Happy to do so. Uh, school board, school teacher, whatever. You want me to come to your school and do workshops and seminars? Glad to do that. I did a workshop one time in Prince George for the Municipal Officers Association of British Columbia many years ago. But I'm I'm happy to do that. I, I, I go anywhere in B.C. and do that. So get on the line and give us a call. Again, we're talking about your money, more importantly about your money, how to keep it. So what I want to do, 
is look here at strategic asset allocation in the three portfolios, and we already did it. It's right there. And that's, that's the general setup of those portfolios. And then if we look at the holdings table, this is what the person has right now. And the money that's in this portfolio is invested in RBC Select Balance, 7.32%. RBC Select Choices Balance, 7.26%. RBC Conservative, 1.15%. We already covered this originally, so I'm just reviewing it right now. But that's the existing portfolio. If we look at the index we're comparing it with, we're comparing it with 40% in iShares Canadian Universal Bond Index, iShares Standard & Poor TSX Cap Composite Index 60. Return on that over five years is 9.51% on the index, uh, 781 on the existing portfolio. And in my portfolio that I'm recommending as a replacement, here's the funds. We got Dynamic Energy Income, Dynamic Global Infrastructure, McKenzie U.S. Uh, growth Fund, um, that's 3%, 3%, and 5%. RBC Canadian Equity Fund, uh, 20%. RBC Global High Yield Bond Fund, 25 3% Century Small Mid Cap, 25% in TD Canadian Bond Fund, uh, 3% in TD Entertainment Communication, 3% in TD Health Science, 10% in TD Short Term Bond. Weighted return on that portfolio over five years is 12.11%. 12.11%. Uh, so that portfolio is well designed, it's well balanced, it's well diversified. There's uh, 10 different holdings, 10 different sectors, and five different companies. So you got great diversification, not all one company. Uh, two dynamic funds, one McKenzie fund, two RBC funds, one Century fund, and four TD funds. Um, all the information is there. The 10-year rate of return is 7.5. The five-year rate of return is 12.11. All these funds have a five-year track record, every single one of them. So if we look at the holdings in the chart and we compare the holdings, there's the holdings. There's the 10 funds I just reviewed there on, on the pie chart on the right compared to one, two, three, four. Four funds in what the, what the guy has right now, all RBC, five different companies here, 10 different funds, much better diversification. So that compares the holdings. Now I'm gonna skip because uh, time is getting short, so I'm gonna skip over some of these. I wanna look at the growth of $10,000 invested, which is really what everybody's interested in. So we look at the return on the benchmark, the case study, and on the model portfolio. This line here represents an investment of $10,000 $14,500 in the model portfolio. This represents the uh, benchmark, and this line here represents what the client has right now. Not much different. So starting out, by the end of that first run, they were almost all the same. But where things get tough is when we run into the, the recession. So if we look at, at the, the case study, the recession is represented by that red line, and there's no gain. It went down seriously. It almost went right back to 10,000. 10,000 invested was worth four, almost 14.5. It dropped almost back to 10, and then it recovered over here. That, that represents almost five years. And then in the, in the benchmark, it's worse. There's mine. A very, very not so deep, didn't go down so much, and it recovered very quickly. Represents about a year of no return, as opposed to four and five years of no return in the other situations. And then if we extend that out in the uh, client's current holdings, ends up with $15,761. We covered that already. And in the second case, is 19504 That's the benchmark better than the current holdings. In my portfolio, portfolio five is $20,120. So it wins. But what's significant about that is that line there is almost straight. It doesn't, there's not much variance in it compared to the other situations. So you, you're not having a heart attack and you're not having a hard time sleeping at nights because you're worried about your investments. 
you know you have the best funds in your portfolio, and that's what's important. And you know why you have them. And I can back it up. So if you come into my office and you sit down with me and you say, well, how are you able to do this? Anything I say, I can back it up. And that's what's important. So if we... I messed up there. Uh, so if we go to additional measurements... Now let's talk about volatility. We still have time. So here's your volatility. Your moderate portfolio is 10. The case study is 3.28. The benchmark is 5.9. I'm in between the two at 4.01. So I'm a little more volatile than the case study. I wouldn't necessarily say that by the chart, but as measured by standard deviation over three years. Remember, that's only three years in this case. So over the last three years, the risk is a little less in the case study, but not much. And if you compare them, there they are. So... We have the case study is 3.28, the uh, uh, model portfolio is 4.1, the benchmark is 5.9, moderate risk is 10. Those are the numbers. If we look at the, uh, at the best and worst 12 months, there they are there. So um, the, for the period ending 2010, my portfolio was up 31%. The benchmark was up 30.10. The case study was only up 17.4. Worst case scenario when it comes to the downside of the market. For the case study period ending February 09, it was minus 15%. And uh, the benchmark was minus 23. I was only minus 11. Less risk, better rates of return. Additional measurements, we have alpha, we have beta, we got standard deviation, R squared, and the sharp ratio. And I'm not going to go into those right now. That gets a little highly technical. But these are ways to measure, in clear terms, the performance of portfolios. It's called modern portfolio theory. All these indicators are intended to help investors determine a potential investment's risk-reward ratio. That's what we're talking about. So I have a little table here, which I haven't completed yet. I'm going to be working on it. got to do the calculations to calculate this. We got the, the, the CAPM, the alpha, the beta, the standard deviation, R squared, sharp ratio, and trainer. And uh, we'll be doing that. Now, this here sums it up very well. This is called the efficient frontier. This puts it all together in one chart. So here I have a chart. That corner, the upper right-hand or left-hand corner, says low risk, high return. That's what everybody wants. Less risk, greater return. So if, if you plot that and the dots in that corner, that's a great fund. This one here is high risk and low return. Nobody wants that. High risk, high return is probably what you're going to get. you got to take some risk to get the high rate of return. And this corner here is low risk, low return. Well, that's a GIC. That green line that runs across there is called the efficient frontier. And when you plot funds on that chart, you want them to be on that green line. So the case study is right there. It's below the green line by far, which means it's not efficient. The benchmark itself is not efficient. It's not a good benchmark. I need to talk to my CFA that's on staff about that benchmark because I want a benchmark which is closer to the green line. Okay. The replacement portfolio is right there, and that's a smiley face because it's right on the green line. So that basically says the amount of risk in that one is less than the benchmark. Um, it's a little greater than the model portfolio or the existing portfolio, but the return makes it worth it. You might go for this one if you had couldn't handle the risk, but you're still and you're still on the green line. Your rate of return is about five percent over five years. Or if you go way up here on 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 the right hand side, I just clicked I didn't mean to do that. I'm gonna go do this again. There we are. So if we look at this one here, your rate of return is twenty two percent. The risk is still less than ten. Remember ten is moderate. 
And every one of the model portfolios that I offer is on that green line, which means they're efficient. And that's the bottom line. That measures performance. So having said that, I'm out of gas. I'm out of time. I got to go. Same time, same station next week. Bye for now. If you'd like Fred to review your portfolio, call his office right now at 604-737-3512. That's 604-737-3512.